Good morning or good afternoon, depending on when I get this uploaded. Um, it is Sunday, and it's time for your weekly black pill. Uh, I hate to do this, but I, I, I saw something really interesting. Somebody uh, sent me this flyer for uh, advertising new construction homes. I'm told that it's from the mid-50s, and it uh, appears to be uh, in, in Sarasota, Florida. And so I try, I tried to do some digging to make sure that, you know, I could find this neighborhood and confirm that it, you know, it is what I think it is before I go off and extrapolate and make a whole bunch of, make a whole video talking about, um, what you see here, which are these prices. And as you can see, oh, well, yeah, whoop de doo prices for homes were a lot lower in the 1950s. Prices for everything were a lot lower in the 1950s. We know this. The dollar's been losing value steadily uh, ever since the creation of the Federal Reserve. Um, this is not a mystery. In the 19th century, we had significant deflation. The value of the dollar went up every year. Um, you know, ordinary Americans were getting richer and richer, especially you know after the Civil War with the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Things were getting cheaper. Quality of life was improving. Cost of living was going down, and all that re started to reverse itself after you know the creation of the Fed. But. Um, I uh, decided to just go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, um, which is an official U.S. government source, and say, hey, you know what? Using uh, the U.S. government's official rate of inflation, um, what should the price of these homes, and as you can see here, um, a uh, one-bedroom uh, house was going for like $5,900, a uh, two-bedroom was going for about 6800 and uh, the uh, three bedroom was about 7,700. Well, using the Bureau of Labor Statistics official inflation calculator, the numbers actually come out really clean. Um, the, the prices of these homes um, using the standard rate of inflation, if it was just tracking inflation, which you know is typical for housing prices. Actually, you know, housing prices historically have tracked wage growth, but we know that wages haven't been growing, especially in real terms over the past uh, 50 years or so. Um, and so you have to, you would have to think, well, these would probably track pretty close with inflation, right? Well, putting that in, uh, these, the, the, the price of these houses, uh, should have increased by about 10 times over, uh, you know, since, you know, since they were built, assuming mid fifties, 1955, uh, 1956 is what I think I put in there. Which, by the way, I did look up the neighborhood. These houses were built in the 50s. Um, I was able to find them on the map and pull up a couple of them, like on uh, uh, Zillow and those sites. And it, at least they claim, seem to show year of construction in the 50s. So I think it's fair to calculate the rate of inflation you know, from 1956 to 2021. And so the one-bedroom house um, in today's money supposedly should have cost you uh, $58,000. The two-bedroom would have cost you $67,000. And uh, the three-bedroom would have cost you uh, um, uh, $77,000. And interestingly enough, I figured, hey, just for kicks, since the left is always talking about how we need a living wage, how the minimum wage should be a living wage, I said, well, gee, um, these prices seem really cheap. I wonder if the minimum wage back in the 1950s um, would have been a quote-unquote living wage uh, in which you could have afforded uh, to live in one of, to buy a brand new house. Not just, you know, afford to pay your rent in your apartment. Go out and buy a brand new house and make a mortgage payment. And so I pulled up a, uh, I found a site, uh, it's, I believe it's called the U.S. Mortgage Calculator. I'll try to link to it in the description so you guys can go and try and enter the same stuff I did. And I said, well, let's assume, because back then the FHA did exist, the Federal Housing Authority, I believe the FHA was making loans back then. I said, well, if you got an FHA mortgage on one of these houses, let's just say the one bedroom, you know, because again, we are talking minimum wage. Um, uh, could you uh, afford... The mortgage payment, I had to, you know, go in and put in all the parameters, and I put 20% down because that's pretty standard. And so the mortgage payment for the one bedroom came out to be about like 383 a month, I think. And for the, uh, and that's including everything, taxes and insurance and all that. Um, uh, the, uh, the for the so that's for the for the one bedroom for the two bedroom it came out to be I believe 432 a month or so and again you guys can enter in whatever different parameters you want to and I did that assuming a five percent interest rate because interest rates were quite low in the 1950s um, that helped fuel the you know the the birth of you know modern suburbia 
uh, which of course occurred in the 1950s. They did have not as low mortgage rates as we have right now, but mortgage rates were pretty darn low, um, I believe around 5%. Who knows, maybe if you had good credit, you might have been able to get a, a rate in the fours. But I always hear, you know, low interest rates when they're talking about when mortgage rates are low, they say, oh, my gosh, it's the lowest since, you know, the 1950s. So for the so I, I didn't bother calculating for the three bedroom because I think that that would be a little ridiculous to assume that somebody on um, minimum wage could ever afford, you know, a three bedroom house. But I said, OK, let's look at the one bedroom and the two bedroom. Uh, let's say you're a, you know, you're a couple or a single person, uh, you know, your wife doesn't work. Um, can you afford the one bedroom? Or let's say you have a kid. Can you afford the, um, you know, can you afford the two bedroom? Well, then I looked up minimum wage back in 1956. Minimum wage was a dollar an hour. Uh, before that, and I believe it was 75 cents an hour, and uh, you probably wouldn't have been able to afford this under that. But I, again, since I started with the inflation thing from 1956, I'm using 1956 minimum wage. And so, of course, putting, uh, since I told you that the, the prices of the houses uh, went up by about, or I, the, 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 that inflation went up by about 10 times from 1956 to uh, 2021, um, the minimum wage then, if it was a dollar back then, would be about $10 today, which actually is, you know, fairly comparable to a lot of the country. It's actually lower than, um, uh, than in a lot of places. And so minimum wage back then would have been if you were working full time, you know, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks out of the year getting paid, uh, you would have been making about 20K a year. Uh, and assuming, you know, that the general rule that they tell you to use when you're calculating, OK, how much how much how big of a mortgage payment can I afford? They say, well, you want to keep it to about to no more than 28 percent of your annual income. Um, do you want, you know, to be your mortgage or your rent payments? And that's just an ideal number. I'm sure poor people who have, you know, no disposable income, housing is going to take up a much larger percentage of their annual income, and they're just going to have, you know, they're just going to have to buy less of other things. But to live comfortably, you know, the, the general rule is 28 percent. So 28 um, percent, uh, you know, divided uh, of of 20,000 divided by 12 comes to uh, $467 a month, which is uh, more than either the mortgage payment for the one bedroom or the two bedroom. So what that means is that back in 1956, if you were working full-time minimum wage, you could afford to buy a brand new house um, in, uh, in Sarasota, Florida. And nowadays, um, nowhere <laughs> is, it, you know, is minimum wage considered to be something that you could ever live off of. Um, you know, even to pay your own rent, let alone to, um, uh, to to purchase a brand new house. And I guess before I get any further, I should point out, I did look up how much these houses are, you know, what they're list being listed at around these days and what they seem to be selling for. Um, and uh, from what I saw, now I couldn't tell, I, I, I didn't dive down if maybe some of these were the three bedroom or the two bedroom, but either way... <laughs> massive price increase over what you would expect over what the official inflation rate is you know for the for the country um these houses seem to be selling it in the high twos or close to three hundred thousand um I, I think i even saw a couple listed over three hundred thousand in this sun haven neighborhood when i tried to you know dive down on where it is it was so in other words uh, the um price of houses in this neighborhood, which did not appear to be a particularly nice neighborhood these days. And you have to imagine back in the 50s when these were built, they were not particularly nice houses because they are still really cheap houses even by 1950 standards. They're quite small. Um, I, I think like a thousand square feet or less. Probably the three bedroom ones were around a thousand square feet, which again was you know, pretty typical back then to have smaller houses um, because you had a lot, you know, you, by, I, houses were affordable back then this is one of the ways that they did it is by making the houses smaller but even if you built a house that this you know this the house is this small these days they would not be this cheap and so it would appear as though the uh the rate of increase of prices of these homes since they were built um was about three to four times higher than the standard rate of inflation and so housing is such is becoming uh, clearly becoming more expensive in this country as time goes on. The uh, despite all of the you know the low interest rates and all of these programs and things um, uh, that uh, the federal government and other governments have introduced to try and make uh, you know the, the quote unquote the American dream of home ownership you know more realistic for people. Housing prices um, are going up 
higher and higher, much faster than people's wages are growing. As we know, wages are pretty much stagnant. And I think it would be very interesting I, if we could find um, some more advertisements like this uh, from different you know, times in history in the past when houses were built and calculate just how much the, uh, the value of them has gone up since they were built and just how affordable housing used to be in this country. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. You know, I mean, that's something that, uh, you know, you would think that the, um, uh, the, uh, the so-called free market conservatives who are always talking about how, oh my gosh, we need to raise the minimum wage. Uh, you know, that's a bad idea. Rather than making the argument that, uh, oh, well, on the minimum wage, you just, you know, you shouldn't be able to support yourself. That doesn't make any sense. You know, point out that in the past, on the minimum wage, which was not any higher back then, you know, adjusted for inflation than it is today. Um, you know, the minimum wage was not a, a dollar fifty an hour in 1956. It was $1. And I think very clearly that uh, at least in, uh, in, in this neighborhood, and I'm sure it's true of many places across the country, you know, Sarasota, Florida has never been a particularly cheap place to live, to my knowledge. You know, it's a vacation destination. It, you know, it, it, it has a... It's, pretty luxurious, yet in the past, um, someone could easily, you know, own their own home and live a decent life, even on minimum wage. And so the problem isn't that minimum wage hasn't gone up. The problem is that everything, that the cost of living has gone up and nobody wants to do a damn thing about it. As the cost of living goes up year after year in this country, um, the average American just gets poorer and poorer. And nobody seems to really put this into perspective and point out that, you know, things are harder than they used to be. And that, you know, it does cost a lot more to, you know, just to get by in this country than it did in the past. And nobody asks themselves, you know, why that is. I mean, to the extent that anybody does address this, they say, well, China took our jobs, um, you know, which is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty surface level understanding. Because, uh, you know, as I, as I think uh, most people who are economically inclined already know, if all of these jobs that China, you know, quote unquote, took suddenly came back and Americans, you know, took those jobs and worked them, cost of living wouldn't come down. Cost of living would still be high and we would all be, you know, not making a whole lot of money because those jobs didn't pay very much. It's not that those jobs paid so well. It's that the cost of living was so much lower back then that, you know, you could just work in a factory for your entire life and raise a family. If you made $40,000 a year, uh, you know, in today's dollars back in the 1950s, uh, you were doing very, very well. You would have been able to easily support, you know, a wife and a child or two, you know, and, and have a house. Although maybe with two kids, it would have gotten a bit tight. But I mean, certainly you could have supported your wife and your child in one child. Uh, you know, living in a two-bedroom house, if you're making $40,000 a year, as we saw, somebody making $20,000 a year could at least, you know, make the mortgage payment and support themselves. And so then who really is the culprit behind all this? Obviously, it's the Fed, because the Fed's policies are what drives up the cost of living year after year. And the Fed is also responsible for all the jobs being outsourced, although that's a bit more of a complicated discussion. But, uh, you know, if you want to know why China, you know, was able to take away all of our precious manufacturing jobs, it's because when you have the world reserve currency, you can just print money and spend it on imports and essentially, you know, print. Well, I mean, you can just print money by imports and not have, um, a, a, you know, a, a requisite uh a proportionate increase in inflation. You know, it's not like if, if you were a, a normal country with a closed economy and you didn't uh, participate in international trade or anything like that, and you just printed money um, to buy more goods. Well, there's no more production going on in your country. And so very, you know, very quickly, uh, there would be a glut of dollars uh, relative to the amount of goods and prices would start to go up. Those dollars, you know, would be, you know, staying in circulation. But what happens when you have the world reserve currency is that constantly um, uh, banks around the world are looking to, you know, expand their reserves and such. Um, and they take dollars that are put into the global economy uh, through, um, through the U.S. exporting dollars and importing goods. And they take those dollars and they take them out of circulation and they sit on them and they throw them in a vault. And so the entire world, you know, as a, because it's, you know, it's a reserve asset, 
is constantly trying to accumulate more and more dollars and just sit on them and take them out of circulation. And so that leads to the U.S. Um, uh, being able to print lots of money to import lots of goods without the price of those uh, imported goods going up. And so this is why um, imports are unable to compete with domestically manufactured goods. That's why it hollows out your manufacturing, uh, because if uh, the U.S. just printed lots of money and spent it on domestically produced goods, uh, well, then the price of those domestically produced goods would go up. And that's exactly you know, what's happened. Uh, the price of uh, stuff made in America has, you know, is ridiculous. Uh, have you ever thought about uh, trying to buy, um, you know, a socket set from Snap-on or something like that? It's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, whereas if you buy one made in China or Taiwan, uh, you know, you can get a socket set, uh, a decent socket set, pretty cheap. And so that's just, you know, an example of, of one product, you know, and, and that's kind of an old tiny thing, you know, uh, hand tools. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's been so long since America was a big, you know, manufacturing center that you kind of have to go back to more primitive stuff, more primitive products um, to, to get a head to head comparison. But anyway, that's what's happened is that uh, all of this money printing um, over, you know, past century has inflated the price of goods here in the United States. It's inflated housing, it's inflated stocks, it's inflated everything that's made in America, and the price of stuff made outside of America has stayed relatively stable. And so as the relative price difference between stuff made in America and made in other countries has nothing to do with China, if it wasn't China, it'd be India or Vietnam or Taiwan, which it was before, you know, China was Taiwan, Japan, um, it would be some other country because China is not the problem here. The United States is the problem here. And so the problem of outsourcing, of you know, the hollowing out of our economy, of, of you know, the, the perpetual rise in the cost of living, um, the cost of housing and all this, will not be solved until um, the US uh, loses world reserve currency status, for one thing, um, and preferably, uh, you know, returns to a hard money standard, though I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. But at least if we lost world reserve currency status, we would, um, we would face the consequences for our inflation and the price of everything would go up and you wouldn't have this disproportionate um, increase in prices to where, you know, we can, we can sort of numb the pain of inflation by just importing goods that aren't rising in price as fast as our domestically produced goods. Uh, because if, if that were the case, if everything were suddenly to start shooting up and everything was really expensive, well, then there would be a great impetus to stop inflating the money. Then the Fed would be forced to at least be somewhat uh, more reasonable in, uh, you know, with how much money it prints, because then, you know, it would face the same consequences that central banks like those in Zimbabwe or Argentina or Weimar Germany faced. So in closing, the reason why the average rate of inflation um, uh, shown by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the CPI, um, part of the reason, well, there's two reasons. Well, the first reason why the CPI is so much lower than reality and why when you compare the price of really anything to the CPI um, over a decent period of time, it seems to be rising at a much faster rate than the CPI would indicate. One is that they, they rig the CPI by throwing out um, things like housing or fuel um, or food. <laughs> that um, uh, that they don't like because those go up too fast. I mean, uh, housing is not included in CPI. So it's not, you know, it's, it's technically, you know, you would say, oh, it's not fair to compare housing prices to the CPI because housing is not a part of the CPI. It's like, yeah, the reason why housing is not, you know, it's not taken into to account when the government is calculating the rate of inflation is because housing prices are going up too fast. Well, now I completely forgot the second thing I was going to say. But yeah, the CPI is a joke. Um, you, you know, if you're even if your wages in real terms are stable and you make the same amount of money today that you did decades ago, you're just getting poorer over time. Everyone is. Not only do your does the rise in your income need to beat inflation every year, um, you need to earn even more on top of that because the official rate of inflation is so ridiculously rigged lower. So I think I'll, I've made my point, and I'll, I guess I'll end it off there for today.